Welcome back uh, to the branding experience. We are now in week five or week three if you are in a quad semester. So we'll be just starting week three if you're in the quad semester. Uh, so today's a fun uh, class. Um, we're going to talk about uh, different types of uh, marketing, um, which kind of cool is um, kind of get off topic right away. But uh, I want to talk about this picture here. Um, this is where uh, Sprite um, for uh, a promotional, what we call experiential marketing, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but I just want to show this picture, um, how it's cool for a shower and how refreshing it is um, that they made these showers that came down on the beach for people so they could all try and experience. And it kind of looks like a, um, a soda pop machine, uh, <clears throat> which is kind of cool. Um, really cool idea. Um, got a lot of uh, publicity because of it. Um, and I think it really strives the point home. It's a really creative way of looking at it. But anyways, um, we'll talk about that uh, in the next uh, slides. Uh, so let's get right into it. So today we are going to talk about experiential marketing. Uh, and we're going to talk about ambush marketing and talk about uh, the difference between the two. Um, we're going to watch in a video with experiential marketing. Um, there's also uh, a little bit of history on experiential marketing. Um, experiential marketing, uh, when uh, it was originally uh, termed, it was actually before it was called gorilla, uh, not gorilla, like our oh, 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 gorilla, uh, or oh, 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 gorilla, <clears throat> like King Kong, uh, but gorilla, uh, where it uses uh, irregular tactics um, uh, that you were used by civilians in, in, uh, in warfare. So they applied it. And if you look at this um, picture right here, um, you can see that uh, this is an example here where um, McDonald's um, makes it look like you're walking on their french fries or actually walking through their french fries, which is really kind of cool. Um, so you're not physically touching it. I go, well, I guess you are technically. You're walking on the yellow stripes. Um, but it kind of gives you, you know, you can't not notice it when you're walking through. And it kind of gives you that feeling that you're walking through uh, a little pack of fries. Um, so let's look at the definition of experimental uh, or experiential, sorry. <clears throat> so it's a way to connect to consumers so they experience, that's the word experiential, or feel the product or brand. <clears throat> so this person here, anyone recognize um, this type of uh, marketing? And what company? Yeah, have you ever been to Costco? <clears throat> this is the famous... Uh, sample area that a lot of people go to. And that's basically the same example where you just try at every aisle. Um, I mean, there's people that go to Costco specifically just to get the samples. Uh, but this is a, a one small, uh, simple way. Um, but I'm gonna, we're gonna watch a video that gets into more detail um, and talk about it, uh, about how companies can do um, things a little bit differently. There's a little interview in the, in the video um, but it's pretty cool. So sit back, enjoy, um, and here we go. This episode is Bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Can we get Gwen Stefani somewhere? Like, can we interview her? On this episode of Ryan Learned Something, we're going to be talking about guerrilla marketing, which nowadays people call it experiential marketing or engagement marketing. But we're going to look at how, you know, small scale graffiti artists do their type of marketing all the way up to big brands doing ginormous events. And, and we're going to get weird in a gorilla suit. Let's talk about guerrilla marketing. The term was coined by a big-time Chicago ad man named Jay Conrad Levinson. He wrote a book about it in the 80s, creative title, Jay. The concept was simple. Do something unexpected to get a lot of people talking about your brand. But guerrilla marketing tactics existed long before someone finally gave them a name and wrote a book about them. There's the Goodyear Blimp, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. More recently, brands have taken guerrilla marketing to the next level, literally. Mini Cooper stuck their cars on the sides of buildings. Domino's delivered pizza by drone. And Red Bull live streamed guys skydiving from the edge of space. 
Now, guerrilla marketing doesn't have to cost a fortune to work. It could be as cheap as a restaurant flyer stuck under your windshield wiper, or as simple as putting up a few posters. Wild postings are one of the oldest forms of marketing. Check out this watercolor from 1835. Look familiar? And today, non-traditional marketers have an important tool in their hands, the internet. From flash mobs to viral videos to hashtags on social media, technology has allowed the interaction to extend well beyond a single physical location. The latest trend is experiential marketing, where brands create unique experiences and invite people to participate, like TNT's Push for Drama Style, or Dove's Choose Beautiful Style. Or when The Simpsons took over a dozen 7-Elevens and turned them into quickie marts. It just goes to show that brands are continually trying to reinvent the way they can get our attention, earn our devotion, and sell us more stuff. Now where's my Red Bull? So I got one book on experiential marketing. It's called Experiential Marketing. Go figure. And I started reading it and it wasn't my favorite read. But uh, yeah, if you want some information, it's alright. I'm gonna go try and find something on YouTube. I feel like it might be more, more worth my time. It is. This video makes it seem like guerrilla marketing, just like the dad joke of the marketing world, just like puns. That was a good ad. If you ever had to watch that on YouTube, look that up. So I found some great examples, but I think it's probably best to just go talk to an expert. Good morning. It is 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to meet with one of the best experience-based marketing firms in Los Angeles. They're called Vcor. I've got some questions for them. We're also going to go eat my favorite chicken and waffles at Roscoe's. That's, that's number one item on the agenda. You guys should watch a lot of his videos. They're quite good. And entertaining, really, at the end of the day. When you come to LA, you have to hit up Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. And Chicken and Waffles is becoming a theme around here. That's right. The hype is definitely real. I looked at a bunch of different street art. I saw a Banksy, a ton of Shepherd Fairies. We went to the Paul Smith building, which is like, a, normally it's just a pink wall, but somebody had tagged it like the night before. It made this like weird juxtaposition that they were having to repaint over the graffiti, which is funny because that's basically what their wall is to begin with, is this art piece. Then we went to B Corp. B Corp is a really rad company. They do a ton of big, large scale and small scale experience based marketing projects. We are B Corp Incorporated. We're an experiential marketing agency here in Los Angeles, California. We specialize in creating an experience and an interchange that helps people appreciate that brand, product, or service. Talk about B artists and how, I mean, they were kind of. Kind of where you guys came out of, right? Experience marketing kind of started with these street team guerrilla marketing type things. That's as guerrilla as it gets for sure, although it's becoming more and more acceptable. I, I like the way Banksy put it. You know, people look at him as if he's a criminal because he puts his art up uh, in places that nobody asked him to be. His response is marketers are shoving their message at me. They're inserting their message everywhere I go. I didn't ask for that. I didn't get approval to have your message pasted on every inch, square inch where I go. Why is it different from what I'm doing? The term guerrilla marketing kind of arose out of a non-traditional approach to kind of insert yourself into the conversation. What we do is probably the opposite of guerrilla. I think we're, we're trying to create a compelling environment that spontaneous moments can happen. And it could be anything from 
um, a pop-up shop or a mobile tour or a skate park on a barge or a PR stunt. It's non-traditional still what we do. So it's not just speaking at someone, but we're speaking with them. But I think the biggest challenge comes to, you can see a picture of a blueberry pie and I can tell you how delicious it is, encourage you to try it and hope that you will and tell your friends. Or I can slice a pie up and give you a piece and hand it out. Classical. I'm going to walk away knowing if I want this or not because of that. When experiential is authentic, it's enjoyable because what you're doing is you're providing a service that the people want. Most consumers are really easily delighted. Um, if it's a brand that they really love and they feel like that brand gets them, it doesn't always have to be big as long as it's meaningful. And Three simple things that you should focus on. Who do you want to talk to? Where are you going to find that person? What's a great way to demonstrate what it is you're doing? We take all of the research and the strategy and then we do a big brainstorm. And so that's where we start getting into the creative ideas and figuring out what we want to do. Everything in the entire world is a beginning of a brainstorm for an experience. There's always a period when we're yeah. ideating where we let ourselves get really crazy. And I think that's the really fun part is to be like, oh my God, that's a crazy idea, and just go as far as we can. So let's have, what's the best solution first? Mm -hmm. Let's just start, what's the best solution? For this issue or this problem, this challenge. And we start reverse engineering. We'll try and find a way to make it work. Because what we're doing is so non-traditional, it hasn't been done before. And so that's really the trick of how do we show this to the client, something that's never been done before and never been made, in a way where they can imagine it and see it coming to life and understand what that experience is going to be with people so that they can dream with us what the possibility of what we're actually going to build will be. How do you guys quantify it? you know, results, whether that's success or failure, or how do you figure out when something's done well? What are the goals? What's the definition of success? Where are we going? What's our demographic? What are a number of qualifiers. We decide what that is. I think in the best situation, an experiential campaign includes the digital team. How do we quantify that emotional connection that then leads to the digital? Because that is where those hard numbers come in. Five years ago, you weren't talking about social extensions and digital extensions, and it was a lot harder to measure how successful experiential was. I see the future of experiential marketing hands down as the future of marketing. I don't think that social will stand alone. I don't think traditional will stand alone. I think it's all going to come under an umbrella where all of these pieces are talking to each other because that's the only way where you're telling this story that all of the pieces make sense and talk to each other together. And then you're having this authentic conversation with the public. And that's where you get a really, really powerful campaign that lasts with people and really changes how they feel about you as a brand. I put on a freaking gorilla suit and I went and gave out free bananas. Let me explain a little more. To test some of what I learned at B Corp, I have an experiment. I want to do something that's experiential and will also delight people. So. I'm going to put on a gorilla suit and hand out free bananas. That's that's more what I'm doing. Not that was a bad explanation. <laughs> gorilla on a hoverboard. Can't get better than that. You know, I put my sweat into this. I'm done. People don't want to take your free stuff because they're like, ah, is this a gimmick? What's in it from like, what do I have to do for it? And I was just giving out free bananas. But what was funny was I went to one corner and there were these girls and a guy handing out cards for, I don't know, they were selling something and they were handing out postcards. No one was taking the postcards, but I gave out a ton of bananas on the corner. And I think it's – two reasons, I think, because one, it's goofy as crap because I was in a gorilla suit. And two, because being in a gorilla suit, there didn't have to be a full-blown interaction. That It was just kind of assumed like, oh, I don't have to talk to you. I can just take your banana. So it kind of eliminated the awkwardness and kind of just opened – I think it opened up people's bubble a little more.
So the one thing I would change about the gorilla suit was I just wanted to experiment and see if people would take the bananas. But the one thing I would add is maybe a call to action or some way of letting them know what we were doing. The sign did say Ryan learned something, so maybe they'll go Google it. But So this has been a crazy episode. I flew to Los Angeles, saw a bunch of cool street art. I talked to B Core, which is an amazing agency who does this experience-based marketing. And then... I came back and I put on a freaking gorilla costume and gave out free bananas. And it's just been a crazy cool experience and I've actually learned a lot. So here's my takeaways. So number one, it can scale. You can start small and go as big as you want, but even if you have like $10, you can figure something out. And that's the coolest part about experience or gorilla marketing. Like I'm not going to tell you to do anything illegal, but you could probably do some illegal things. That's probably okay. Don't do things illegal. Shepard Ferry did it. He's been arrested. He's core. You think Banksy gives a crap? Banksy don't give a crap. Although I think that Banksy is Mr. Brainwash. Huh? So number two, it's all about the relationship. You're wanting to create an emotional connection with whoever you're trying to connect with. And experience-based marketing, like that's that's like the core of it, right? You want to go and do these things that are on your brand, whether that's using um, artwork or you're trying to break the mundane of their day while they're walking on the street and get them to remember who you are. And that's the basis of Gorilla or experience marketing. So number three, use technology, but don't use it as like a crutch. Social media and things like that are a multiplier. So you have to have the main event to multiply that message. So you got to go out and do something really cool and you can use technology and B Corp talked about even like RFID and things like that. So you can measure the impressions there, but don't worry so much about the back end of like, what are we getting out of it? Because it's all about that actual experience and the relationship you built there and then use technology as much as you can within that but don't use it as like the sole purpose of doing what you're doing all right here's what i spent this episode i bought a gorilla suit on amazon for 71 dollars, which is cheap enough that i think everyone should go pick one up i got the book experiential marketing for 18 dollars. the trip to la including flights and roscoe's was 503 dollars. total spent 592 dollars that leaves me with $11,361 of the $15,000 I started with. Let's have a moment of silence for Harambe. Okay. <clears throat> so it's uh, a lot that uh, Ryan learns. If you have a chance, follow him. Um, give him a like uh, on YouTube. He's got some really good videos. Um, but I think that the one that I want to talk about is at the end there when he's talking about social media, you hear that all the time where, um, people say, oh, we'll advertise our brand on social media. Um, and I think it's key. That's, it's more of a, an avenue versus, um, an end, um, to get to it. So like he was saying, don't use it as a crutch. Don't just lay it on, use it as a way to quantify whether you're somewhat successful, um, but don't rely fully on it. Right. All right, so that's experiential learning. There's many examples out there. Anything that you, if you look back and you might think over your history, anything that you think, hey, that's a cool, that's cool, uh, is probably some form of experiential or guerrilla marketing. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Let's look about ambush marketing. What do you think ambush marketing would be? If you think it's maybe to um, take a different color here uh to kind of attack because you kind of think of when you think of at, uh, ambush you think attack uh, or sneaky sneaky right so the definition uh of it and this is a good uh, example here i don't know if you can it kind of looks like just one um but in this picture here uh ipod right here posted a billboard with all their iPods and I was showing all the different colors that it came in, which was kind of cool. Rona came along and thought, you know what? We have a paint department. How cool would it be to show all the colors dripping into our cans to show that we collect recycled paint? Fantastic way. So they doubled down. So it was, what they would normally pay for a small boat where they actually Rona uh, got on the, on the, on the bandwagon and they kind of piggybacked uh, Apple. Um, so they carried it over. So they didn't have to pay for a full one. When you really look at this, you're like, Oh, it's iPod um, or is it Rona? So they kind of, but they didn't have to pay for the full um, 
the full advertising. So let's look at the definition. <clears throat> so definition of ambush is a strategy used by non-sponsors. So that's key, non-sponsors. People haven't fully paid for it. To capitalize on an event, giving the false information to make sure, make the consumer think they are the sponsors, right? So at first glance, uh, you kind of think, oh, it's a Rona ad, when really it was originally an Apple ad. So there's a good example, and you can see it here in the pictures of the billboard, or they redid it and they posted another billboard underneath. <clears throat> um, but there's an, actually another good one. Um, in, uh, was it the 2012 Olympics? Um, Nike uh, had, um, instead of paying sponsors, sponsoring the Olympics, they gave all the runners, and they did it just a few years. This is just one year. They gave them these yellow shoes. And every video, what you see of the Olympics, you see them wearing these yellow shoes. Well, it cost them nothing. All they did was donate the shoes. So the shoes would probably cost maybe, uh, Nike probably 10, 15 bucks, maybe. But the key sponsor, I don't know if you can see it, that actually a person who paid for the sponsor, uh, that's a Nike, but there's some other ones in here, okay, was Adidas. Adidas was an official sponsor of the 2012 Olympics. Any guesses what Adidas paid for it? Are you ready? Adidas paid one sorry, $155 million. And what Nike did is they gave them the shoes, so it probably cost them, what, a couple thousand dollars max? So that's ambush marketing. So, But the perception to people watching the Olympics is that Nike was a sponsor, when in essence, it wasn't. <clears throat> and that's the benefit of ambush. And Nike has done this many, many times, and they're very creative at doing that. So when you're looking at ambush marketing, it's examples where you piggyback an event. So uh, if you've ever been to a baseball game or a hockey game and you come outside of the game and then you have some people selling uh, memorabilia or t-shirts or even food, right? You're piggybacking the event um, so that you could generate sales. It looks like you're not necessarily the sponsor, but you're there with the event. Um, any big event, um, you see this happening outside. Um, that would be a, a, a real um, good example of ambush marketing. Um, so yeah, there's many out there, but yeah, if you Google uh, Nike, there's a ton of ones. I'm like, this is just one, and they did it a few years in a row uh, with the Olympics, so not just 2012. All right, so let's look at the homework. So uh, what I want you guys to do, you're going to uh, review week five checklist. You can go through that. You're going to complete assignment number four video assignment and you're going to start on the major assignment number one so you finish the progress assignment in assignment number one now you're going to finish it um, so get going on that all right and we'll see you in the next video